anything that isn't an American high tech system has got quite a good chance of getting through. And so it's a mixture of the wrong sort of defense systems they've got. They've got the and they've got these panzer um, anti missile systems. We've got three of them in Moscow that all overlap, but they're against incoming missiles. Um, a, a, a drone flying low and slow, or a light aircraft flying low and slow, is a different problem altogether. Hello and welcome to Frontline for Times Radio with me, Kate Chabot. And today we are catching up with Professor of Defence Studies, Michael Clark. Professor Clark is a former Director General of the British think tank, RUSI. He's a regular defence and security analyst for Sky News and BFBS SITREP. And he's a prolific writer. His next publication, Great British Commanders, is out later this year. Michael Clark, great to see you again. Um, we were talking last week about the possibility of a pending Russian offensive push in Ukraine. Have you seen any signs which give you, a, as an idea, of when and where that might be? Yes, um, I think it's starting now, in effect. Partly that's d determined, as it always is in Ukraine, by the weather. So it's been a very wet spring. It is drying up now. And in a way, the campaign season begins around about the end of April, beginning of May. And so we can see first uh, a lot of air attacks are built up on cities, particularly Kharkiv. Um, but also we can see that Russian um, uh, strategic air forces are moving towards their bases in Western Russia. So um, satellite imagery shows how many aircraft the Russians are being, bringing into the theater for the use of, of, of fairly extensive air assets, I think. And we can see that they're pushing more or less all the way around the front. So there's quite a big push on uh, northwest of Avdivka. I mean, the Russians took Avdivka about a month ago, and they're now trying to push northwest of that to keep on going. They're not getting too far because the, the Ukrainians are now digging in there, but the Russians are pushing. They're building up force to Kupiansk, I think in probably an attempt to take back Kharkiv Oblast, Kharkiv region, which goes hand in hand with this apparent determination to keep on bombing Kharkiv, the city. So we can see all of this happening and more activity um, round, the, round in the south. Um, the Ukrainians didn't get as far as Tokmak in their southern uh, offensive uh, driving south from Orykiv. But the Russians are trying to take back now the 30 or so kilometers that they lost at that time. Again, they've only had limited um, success. But all the time, every day, the Ukrainians are having to pull back a little bit more, a little bit more. It's, it's half a kilometer a day, something like that. And the Russians are paying dearly for it. The casualties at the moment are about 315,000. That's dead and wounded, seriously wounded. By the end of this year, I'd be surprised if the Russians aren't up to half a million because of the way they do things. But you can see this push all the way around the front is getting stronger every week. And it will reach some sort of uh, crescendo, one would guess, during May when the weather will be conducive then to bringing more main battle tanks forward. Even though the Russians have lost over 2,000 main battle tanks, they're still going to keep going. So you talk about this build-up around the front. Um, do you get a sense yet of whether there will be a, a major push in one area or, or is it undecided yet? It's not really clear. Um, at the moment, the, uh, the push looks to be all the way around the front. And certainly Ukrainian intelligence, as, as far as they're speaking openly, are saying they expect the push to be all the way around the front. Um, if there is a, an area of concentration, I would guess it would probably be in Kupiansk, um, because that's where the Russians have got more forces. It's closer to the Russian border. And the idea of taking back the, the, the whole area of Kharkiv, the oblast that they lost in a surprise offensive, uh, surprise Ukrainian offensive back in the autumn of 2022. That would be very attractive to them. On the other hand, I think the Ukrainians probably feel that they could hold them um, in Kharkiv, whereas the Ukrainians are more vulnerable, I think, probably in the south, because they've been fighting harder there. If I was a Russian general, I'd be more interested in the possibilities of pushing from the south. But that's just as I look at the map um, from this distance. But looking at what the Russians seem to be doing, they look as if they're inclining more towards an offensive in Kharkiv. But that might be a feint. That might be you know, misinformation. And they might try to pull something off further south as a, in a way that would surprise Kiev. That would also be a possibility. And how is Ukraine trying to influence where those major attacks might be? Well, the Ukrainians are doing two things. I mean, one is they're digging in all the way around the front. 
And the reason that the Russians are still finding it hard going, they are making ground, but nothing dramatic, because the Ukrainians are now doing what the Russians were doing last year, which is sowing lots of minefields, putting tank traps down, putting in obstacles and, and digging in, physically digging in trench lines in the way they haven't had to for uh, some time. Um, but also, the Ukrainians are making it clear by attacking inside Russia itself, these attacks on the oil refineries and on um, concentrations of logistics inside Russia. The uh, Ukrainians almost, I think, almost would like to pr provoke the Russians that if they're going to attack anywhere, attack around Kharkiv, because I think the Ukrainians feel they can probably do better there than in the south. And in a way, because the, the east of the country or the, the, the north and the east is the area right around the Russian border, the sense that the Ukrainians are attacking over the border into Russia is very embarrassing for Putin. And Putin has said openly, or is reported to have said openly to his security chiefs, I want a belt of buffer zone. I want a buffer zone, you know, our, on the other side of our border. So I want, I want you to take a, a piece of Ukrainian territory, um, which gives us a buffer zone for places like Belgorod and Rostov, which are suffering from Ukrainian attacks. And I think the attempt to take a whole belt of territory all the way around that border will be quite challenging. And if the Ukrainians feel, well, we're going to, we're going to face a Russian offensive anyway of sorts this autumn, uh, this summer and autumn, then it'd be better if, it, if they try to do this belt idea for us than if they attack as an arrow somewhere further south where they might actually break through. And for the Ukrainians, what they really fear is that the Russians might take Dnipro uh, or Zaporizhia. If they took one of those really big places, then the idea of, of carrying on up the Dnipro River, going northwards towards Kiev, that would be a bit of a nightmare for them. And what do you think will characterise the next few months of the ground war? Because you have Russia effectively poised to go on the offensive, which it finds more difficult than defending, and, and Ukraine having to defend with soldiers virtually looking over their shoulders to see if the ammo and artillery rounds are still coming. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be an arm wrestle, uh, as both sides struggle, neither side are capable of mounting a strategic offensive until sometime next year. We would guess the spring of 2025. And so until then, they're sort of arm wrestling each other on the basis of forces which are fairly exhausted, which are not particularly well supplied. And although the Russians are bringing in up to a, another 100,000 troops on top of the 450 odd thousand they've got there now, they're very, very untrained. They're just bringing them in as cannon fodder, quite literally. Um, and the Ukrainians would kill them all if they had the ammunition, but they're running out of ammunition. Now, if the Ukrainians get the ammunition, then they will certainly give a good account of themselves as they arm wrestle the Russians for the rest of the year. And the Ukrainians, I think, although they can't mount a strategic offensive, they'll try to pull off probably some surprise operations, perhaps in, in the naval sphere, in the Baltic, perhaps against Crimea, which is a very lucrative target for them. I'm sure they'll try some things to unbalance the Russians, to embarrass Putin, to actually worry the Russians. And I've no idea what they would be. I, I could guess, but I mean, it would be pure guesswork. And But the issue really is whether they can find the ammunition. And of course, the ammunition is in America, unless or until America releases its 60 billion in aid package. It's, it's not 60 billion of money that they will give to Kiev. It's 60 billion, which they will spend sending ammunition their ammunition could go it could be on the front line in 10 days two weeks once they allocate the money to send that ammunition and then the money is actually spent making up the stocks for america's own forces um however there is a little bit of good news estonia think that they've found another 1.3 million artillery shells for ukraine which they can gather together the czech republic have been very good they think they've found another one and a half million artillery shell in the world and if the European Union or a country like Japan is prepared to put the cash in, two to three billion dollars, they could buy them immediately and then they'd be in the front line in a little while. The issue for the Ukrainians is that is a big strategic choice. If they think that no more ammunition in significant amounts is going to arrive, then they have to keep on rationing what they've got, which means they just fall back and fall back. If they are confident that more stuff will arrive during the spring and summer, then they'll use up what they've got and they'll give a much better account of themselves. But they don't know, they can't be sure that they are going to be backed up with more ammunition. So that's their problem. Do they, do they ration what they've still got or do they bring it all forward and use it because they're confident that more will arrive in the next month or so? It is an absolutely impossible situation, isn't it? Um, 
Can, can you explain uh, the threat that's being posed to Ukrainian forces by Russia's mass use of guided bombs? How do they work and how lethal are they provo- provo- proving? Yeah, they work very simply and they're very lethal. They're, they're, the, they're called the FAB 500, the FAB 500 or the FAB 1500. And what that refers to is a, either 500 kilogram bomb, which is a thousand pound bomb, um, or a 1500 kilogram bomb, which is a 3000 pound bomb. So you're, you're talking about bombs of, um, you know, up to one and a half tons and so on. And the Russians are even talking about a fab 3000, 3000 kilograms, which would be 6000 pound bomb. So a three ton bomb. Now, there's some question about whether that's really feasible, but there's certainly a fab 500 and a fab 1500. And what they are is old fashioned bombs, old iron gravity bombs, just big bombs. And the Russians have found a way of putting cheap wings onto them, little flip out wings and a cheap GPS guidance system. So um, Russian bombers, an SU-24 or an SU-25, can be 50 or 60 miles behind the front line, flying up at, say, 25, 30,000 feet, even lower than that. They release the bomb, the wings flip out, and the bomb is able to glide up to anything, 25, sometimes 30 miles before it reaches its target, and it's guided onto its target by GPS. There's almost no defense against this. And these are big explosions. You can't shoot them down because it's just a bomb flying through the air. It's not a missile. But it has the, it has the same characteristics of a missile because it can find its target, even with cheap GPS. And they have done enormous damage to uh, f- forces on the front line, to Ukrainian forces. The only way the Ukrainians can counter these Fab 500s and Fab 1500s is by pushing the aircraft which are way behind the Russian front line, out of the battle area. So the only way they can get on top of this is for their own air force, as it were, to be to be fighting over the Russian side of the line. Now, they don't have an air force to do that at the moment. And even with F-16s, even with 100 or so F-16s, by the summer or autumn of this year, it'll probably be too late to make a big difference. And these glide bombs have been doing damage to the Ukrainian line since last autumn. And the Russians have have realized how incredibly valuable they are. They're cheap. They've got lots and lots of them. And they can make these old, dumb, iron big bombs into literally flying bombs that the Ukrainians can't do very much about. And there's a report out saying um, that according to Ukrainian government analysis, up to 500 new ones are being fired a week and that they were actually instrumental in uh, retaking Avdivka. They were. They, I mean, soldiers in Avdivka were reporting 60 and 70 a day landing in their positions. And every bomb... Uh, creates an enormous crater. It just destroys, you know, whatever's there. You can't, you, there's, there's no shelter from these things in effect because they're such big bombs. I mean, 500 kilo bomb, 1,000 pound bomb um, is a big bomb and a, a 3,000 pound bomb, 1,500 kilos, which is what the Russians are mainly using now, just makes, it, it just takes out everything within that within that zone. So in a way, it doesn't matter how deep the trenches are. It, it's very, very destructive. And the Russians are using them in very high numbers. Um, if one could think of a defense against them other than attacking the aircraft, carrying them before they are released, then uh, you know, you'd be very popular in Kiev. But nobody can think of a, an effective mechanism against them. You can't jam them. It's just a bomb flying through the air. You can't shoot them down. They're going too fast. Um, you've got not much time to work out what to do about them because they're released by an aircraft and they're on the ground within 30 seconds or so. Uh, they're almost... Uh, it, it, it's funny. The, the Russians have put so much effort into modern technologies that they claim are are you know penetrative and all of them are less than the russians say they will be but they've now discovered mm. the good old-fashioned bombs with wings on and gps systems are the most hard to defend weapon that they've produced so far you've mentioned um ukraine's uh, long-range strikes uh, over the border into Russia itself. Can you tell us a bit more about the kind of long-range drones that they're using successfully to strike deep inside Russia uh, from Ukraine and the possibility of this capability being expanded? Yeah, it's very interesting that the Ukrainians, because they're having to be inventive and they're using drones more and more, so they're using a lot of drones at the front line, the FPVs, the called first-person vision drones, and and they are almost like um, in lieu of artillery shells. They're, They're using drones far more now uh, and most of, the, most of the Russian tanks they're taking out are with those sort of drones, tactical drones. But um, the ones they're using against Russia are a mixture of things. Some of them are uh, the old Tupolev um, drone, the, the old Soviet-era drone, to which they've re, that, that used to be uh, purely 
non-lethal and they've made it very lethal and it's it's an old russian jet basically so they've used some of those they've built their own drones with quite a long um range and they've used light aircraft they've now discovered that you can robotically fly a perfectly good little cessna light aircraft pack it with explosives it's got a very big warhead and so they've attacked refineries deep inside russia um using all of those different things because a light aircraft um, has got such a low radar signature and it fly it can make it fly slowly and erratically towards the target um, and it can all be done remotely and they've been extremely inventive about that and there's some very dramatic um, footage out there of little light Cessna aircraft <laughs> flying into a refinery and a huge explosion resulting uh, from it. That kind of attack and, and the one that we saw recently on the 2nd of April where, where a drone is reported to have travelled 800 miles into Russia, um, hugely embarrassing for President Putin. Yeah, and these attacks show um, how poor Russia's air defence is. I mean, it goes back to, was it 1972, Matthias Rust uh, was a young German lad who flew a light aircraft into Moscow and landed in Red Square as a stunt. And everybody said, how could they possibly allow that to happen? Well, here we are, you know, more than half a century later, and it can still happen. Russia's air defense is scaled against American high-tech systems. That's, that's their, their target. And anything that isn't an American high-tech system has got quite a good chance of getting through. And so it's a mixture of the wrong sort of defense systems they've got, they've got the, and they've got these panzer um, anti-missile systems, We've got three of them in Moscow that all overlap, but they're against incoming missiles. Um, a, a, a drone flying low and slow or a light aircraft flying low and slow is a different problem altogether. And uh, it isn't just the, the, the te technology of the systems, which isn't very good. Their own operation of them isn't very good because they've never thought that they would face this. They never thought they would face mm. the idea of, of attacks coming from you know, what used to be part of the Soviet Union into their own deep interior. And so the, the Ukrainians have been extremely impressive. It's one of the, the few bright spots in the last couple of months in the way that they've been able to target Russia's facilities. But of course, there's a high political price to pay for that. It's bothering the United States. It has upset the Russian refined petroleum products industry. The Russians are now going to Kazakhstan to get the Kazakhs to supply petrol and refined mm -hmm. products because their own refining capacity has taken a real hit over the last two months. Um, another piece of uh, optimistic news for Ukraine is this uh, £200 million investment by UK and Latvia um, supplying long-range drones with automatic target recognition. Um, how will they operate uh, and what kind of difference will they make? Yeah, they, they will operate and they can make a difference. Um, drones, particularly long-range drones, always use different sorts of navigation. So uh, inertial navigation, where you just set, it, set a drone off on a course, is the is the obvious thing to do but at some point a drone's then got to look down and see what's there and and map it against what um, the operators know is there to find its target and so on and of course it can be it can be jammed but what the ukrainians are finding is that their own civilian technologies are better than some of the military technologies of the west i mean they're finding for instance that american drones that they've been sent or given are tend to be rather clumsy they're not as, as capable actually as the ones they've developed themselves and so this british estonian arrangement is an attempt also to bring in this very inventive high-tech sector that the ukrainians themselves have got and the estonians are pretty good at to bring that sort of civil technology into long-range very accurate drones and ones that can't easily be um, jammed because it, you know in the early days of the war they put a gps uh, tracker on the front of a drone and that was okay but the russians are quite good at at, at frustrating GPS, GPS trackers over a long distance. So if they've got long enough to see the drone moving, they can do something about the GPS signals, which the Ukrainians can't do on the glide bombs we were talking about because they don't have time to frustrate the GPS trackers on those sorts of things. Uh, just to pick up on something you were talking about before, the position that the Ukrainians are in, in that they don't know if and when and how many artillery rounds ammunition is going to be provided by allies. And they're having to make calculations and decisions based on what may or may not arrive. There's a recent quote by a senior Ukrainian uh, military official in Politico complaining that they never get the Western systems at the right time and when they need them. And when they do arrive, they're irrelevant. He was actually talking about specifically about F-16s, which he said would no longer be relevant in, in the coming year. Do you think... Um, Ukraine's allies are ever going to equip it to win the war? It's a very good question. I mean, so far, the allies have been equipping Ukraine not to lose, um, but not 
specifically to win because the Allies are not u really united about what winning means. I mean, I've got no problem in understanding what winning means. For me, it's, it's throwing the Russians out of everything that they've conquered since 2022, and that would look like winning. And then winning better than that would be throw them out of some of the uh, territories they've conquered since uh, 2014. But within the Allies themselves, they, there's not a lot of agreement about, upon that. And there's a lot of nervousness, particularly in Germany, about giving Ukraine enough weapons to really hurt the Russian forces. And so they, they end up dithering between giving the Ukrainians just about what they need to defend themselves, always a bit too late and more Ukrainian lives are lost as a result of it, but not providing the weapons to allow the Ukrainians really to throw the Russians out because too many Western politicians are frightened of Russia if they are thrown out. And in that sense, I mean, Putin has got the frighteners on a lot of Western politicians. Um, not here in the United Kingdom, but certainly in the United States, in Germany, in Italy, in parts of Southern Europe. They, they don't want him to succeed, but they don't want him to fail because they're frightened of him. On the diplomatic front, Britain's Foreign Secretary David Cameron stopped off to see Donald Trump uh, on his visit to the UK, uh, US. He's bound to have talked about aid to Ukraine and NATO after Trump effectively invited Putin to do whatever he liked to members who didn't spend 2% of their GDP on defence. Is the panic setting in, do you think? Yeah, I wouldn't describe it as panic, but it's certainly a, a sober sort of realisation that uh, NATO will be in a different place next year. Um, whether Trump wins the election or not, even if, if Biden wins the election, nevertheless, the atmosphere in the United States is different uh, now than the way it was in 2022. And the Gaza crisis is distracting America in a pretty big way. And that's not going to go away anytime soon either. So I think there's a, there is a sense in NATO that we're into a new phase now and that um, helping Ukraine defend itself will be harder and more expensive than we thought it would be originally. Um, it will be a longer term commitment. And also that, that NATO, although NATO is in some respects stronger than it's ever been in its history before as a result of this uh, invasion in all sorts of ways, nevertheless, it's also very brittle. And this NATO of 32 nations may start to dismantle itself under political pressure. Certainly if Trump wins the election, a number of countries in Southern Europe, in Hungary, in Slovakia, in Austria, um, other countries, not in uh, like Serbia, who's very pro-Putin, they will lean towards Russia on the assumption that NATO is about to be deconstructed and NATO will fall into a sort of a tough minded northern NATO and a very soft minded, pro-Russian minded or philosophical about Russia sort of minded southern NATO. And what, what do you mean, sorry, Mike, when you say that, that NATO might begin to be dismantled exactly? I think NATO might start to dismantle itself because before, I mean, if Trump is elected in November and takes over in January, between November and January, I would expect, you know, Hungary and Slovakia, Austria to start to do deals with Russia. And the Russians will be very aware of this. They'll start to make attractive offers on gas, uh, on uh, oil provision, on sort of certain sorts of aid. There'll be a big propaganda push. And a lot of people in Southern Europe will say, look, the reality is the Russians are going to get away with this. So we've got to adjust ourselves to that. It's no good saying that they must not succeed. The fact is they will succeed. And the new reality for us is that we have to live with a resurgent Putin. Now, we won't say that in Northern Europe. The Scandinavians certainly won't say it. The Baltics won't. We won't. Poland won't. But we'll be a smaller group of nations, 10 nations, say, in the north of, of, of Europe, with an uncertain America or an America about whom we are uncertain. And France and Germany, we don't quite know what view they will take of it. And so that politically, um, NATO will begin to fragment and will not find consensus on what it thinks about its future relations with Russia. And if, if, if Trump is elected, that process will start the day after the election. Very interesting and quite a, a scary thought. Um, in, in terms of, of David Cameron's visit to the US, um, it's, he's trying to get this, uh, this uh, aid deal that you mentioned, the $61 billion US package approved. President Zelensky has said without it, Ukraine will lose the war and he will be wanting to pay, paint that worst case scenario, won't he, to secure that package. Is, is he right? I think he's right that if he doesn't get that um, package, that Ukraine will lose this year of the war, which means they'll lose more territory. Um, and then it becomes a question of whether Zelensky stays in power. Um, what the Russians are hoping for, I think, is not that they could march to Kiev and take it over this year, 
but that they could put so much pressure all the way round on uh, on on Ukraine that there would be um, a political coup in effect in Kiev. Zelensky would be removed and he'd be replaced by somebody who will do a deal. I think that's what they're probably hoping for this year. If the American aid package comes through, that almost certainly won't happen. If it doesn't come through, there's a fair danger that it will happen. Um, and other aid, I mean, the, the EU aid um, that is being proposed, I mean, 50 billion euros is coming through in stages. NATO's own plan, this um, uh, NATO mission on Ukraine, as Stoltenberg talks about it, is 100 billion over five years. And even if that's agreed at the NATO summit in, um, in Washington in the summer, um, that will come in in stages. Um, the problem is that, that all of this is drip feeding Ukraine and making life for Zelensky much harder. If Zelensky could, could get the hit of one big aid package, which will keep Ukraine going, then he keeps his job. If it looks as if for all of his grandstanding around the world, the world is still not prepared to support Ukraine enough, then his job is on the line. And that's really what it comes down to. He needs the political popularity of bringing the world to support Ukraine. And that's not just a financial issue, it's a morale issue. If the Ukrainians feel that the world is really supporting them, the outside Western world is really supporting them, they'll sign up to fight. But if they feel that the world is turning their back on Ukraine and that they are going to lose anyway this year and maybe next year, then why, why turn up to fight? Why not just accept the inevitable? And so in that respect, this aid package is really, really important. One other point um, is that there is increasing interest in having Japan step in also to provide aid because Japan, interestingly, as an Asian power, sees the Ukraine crisis in exactly the same way as NATO sees it and as the Biden administration in the United States sees it. So although Japan is a long way away and the other end of the, the, other end of the globe from the Ukraine crisis, it is not beyond the bounds of possibility that Ukraine could do everybody, uh, that Japan could do everybody a favor and step in with a, a significant financial package. How likely is that looking at the moment? It's a proposal, and um, Kishida, the uh, Ukrainian, ugh, I keep saying, I'll say it again. It's a proposal, and the Japanese Prime Minister, Mr. Kishida, is in Washington. I don't think they're going to make any announcements about anything like that, but the, I think they may be talking about it and discussing it. And there's a lot of interest in building on this Japanese determination to help the West keep Russia contained because they know that a, an ascendant Russia will also bolster an ascendant China. And then the Taiwan crisis gets worse, the whole East Asia crisis or East Asia tensions get worse. And so just as the Western world has, has as it were, at least drawn a line in the sand officially over Ukraine, Japan seems inclined to draw that same line in the sand for the same reasons. A line in the sand. Where do you think Western thinking is on Ukraine? Is it to give Ukraine just enough to stop short of victory but enforce a stalemate um, so that a settlement can be found? It's unthinkable uh, to many Ukrainians, but how avoidable is it? I think the West feels that if the Ukrainians eventually go to some sort of ceasefire or peace talks on favourable terms to them, then that will be good enough. But only the Ukrainians can decide when they're prepared to negotiate. They shouldn't have to negotiate under duress with 15% of their territory being, having been invaded by uh, a foreign power. And so um, there is that sort of sense that the, the line in the sand is to support whatever Ukraine's, whatever Ukraine's decision is about what Ukraine decides is effectively the line of victory. But that, of course, is a rather um, movable line. And that's one of the problems for the West is that we talk about these terms, we'll back Ukraine for as long as it takes, we'll do whatever it takes, we say that, but we don't know in our own minds um, what that really means. As I say, I've got a very clear view in my mind what that means, but that's not the same as, as the um, most states people in Europe, or even in Kiev for that matter. Professor Michael Clark, great to speak to you. Thank you for your time.